he made it very clear from day one that you either did the work, uh, meaning you passed your exams, or you didn't, and it was all the same to them. And uh, that kind of attitude pretty much carried forward in everything I did. Hi everyone, hello, El Ballard is here with you today on our podcast, Empowered Global Women in Business, and I have a special guest with us today. I am excited for this conversation. Bridget, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you, Bridget. Let me introduce you really quickly before we jump into this conversation today. So Bridget Franzen was born and raised and educated in Germany. She had her internship in 1978 on a family-owned livestock farm in Illinois. This internship led to a job offer, which she accepted, and in 1980, she immigrated to the United States, first managing the hog farm of her former host, and then building her own breeding stock farm from the ground up. Dealing with the challenges of doing business in a male-dominated field, she spent 20 years on a hog farm, and then the following 20 years, she worked as a certified financial planner um, and as an estate planner, a business succession planner for farm families. So beautiful career, and now today she's a book author, she's writing her memoirs, and she's about to publish her book titled Have Pigs, will travel. I am so excited to have you with us today, Bridget. I'm fascinated by the name of your book. I cannot wait to discuss it. <laughs> How's the whole name about, but welcome. So uh, the first question I usually like to ask, how did you choose this field? And well, you, you explained that you chose it because you had a an internship, but you know, were there some other things that really led you to a career of 20 years initially on a hog farm, which is so interesting. And then followed by another 20 years um, in the financial field, but still connected to working with the farmers. Um, tell us a little bit more about that field. Yes, I originally wanted to become a large animal veterinarian. Oh. And uh, when I could not get into vet school, I instead uh, majored in agriculture and specialized in uh, animal production. So I still worked with large animals, only this time they were mine. If I had to get up in the, at two in the morning to check on newborns, at least they were mine and I didn't get a phone call where I had to drive to somebody else's farm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so what is, you said early in the morning, what is the schedule when you're doing business such as this, I don't even know, how early do you have to, to wake up, to cater to, to the animals, or what is the sort of like a daily routine for you? Oh, at, at that time, uh, I kept telling people if they want to call me in the morning to, to order breeding stock or sell me feed or whatever, they would have to call me before 6 a.m. because I would leave the house at 6, unless it was market day and, or I had to deliver animals. Then I would start at 4.30. Mm. So long days yeah. and, and sometimes even longer days. But you loved it. You loved working with animals. I did. I did. And I, I knew that if somebody got up early enough to call me before 6 a.m., they were serious. And it was <laughs> usually a good phone call. Yeah, I guess that will narrow down some of the other candidates. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, great. So what are some of the challenges that you mentioned that this was a very heavy male dominated field at a time? What are some of the challenges, either these challenges or what does it really mean being in that field or any other challenges that you could share with us? Uh, there were many different challenges. Some of them I saw coming, some of them I didn't. Most of the time there were helpers somewhere. You know how Mr. Rogers of Sesame Street, he yeah. used to say that uh, whenever there is a problem, look for the helpers. There are helpers everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I had my own farmstead and I needed the help of a carpenter to do some remodeling, I called someone who had left his business card at the uh, local hardware store and uh, he did not show up at the appointed time. Instead, he went to my neighbor and anyone else who would listen and said, of course, he wouldn't work for a single woman. He was a good Christian married man. Uh, 
then the next day, someone showed up who was a retired hog farmer and now worked as a carpenter. And he said, I heard you needed help. I'm here to help. And he had a wife who was competent and helped on the farm. He had a daughter who was roughly my age. And he was just intrigued by the whole thing. And he helped me for years. And uh, I learned a lot about carpentry while I was working with him. Interesting. I want to go back to the country you're from. You know, we have a lot of um, global women that we interview in this podcast um, that are building their businesses um, in different countries, or maybe they lived in different countries or they were born um, in different country living now. Or what are some of the things that maybe favored or limited you being from then as a country and living here now? I grew up in an environment where no excuses were offered and none were accepted. Mm. Uh, if you set out to do something, you, you did it until, uh, until the work was done. For instance, German students at university don't pay tuition, but uh, that also meant uh, you got in by grades alone and professors were not catering to you because you didn't bring tuition money with you. They made it very clear from day one that you either did the work, uh, meaning you passed your exams, or you didn't, and it was all the same to them. And uh, that kind of attitude pretty much carried forward in everything I did. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's interesting, but I totally can relate. It was similar in my country as well, Kazakhstan. So, yeah, there are so many differences, right? And um, sometimes it's parallel, yeah, to bring this cross-culture kind of bridge uh, where we see, you know, some of the different things, even though there's so many similarities <laughs> at, the, at the end of the yes. day, right, between cultures. And something else that favored me is that the area where I ended up living in the United States is very heavily German. It is full of uh, German immigrants, oh, although... Yeah. Uh, it would be one or two generations removed. Mostly it was their grandparents who had moved to the United States, but they still were intrigued by the whole thing. And there was a generally friendly attitude towards me because they liked the concept. You know, here we are, German immigrants, and here's one more. Welcome to the flock. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting um, also point. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. It always helps to, to be surrounded right or have those circles sort of like support circles that you know maybe speak your language uh maybe do sort of like cooking where you you can culturally you know eat the food yes you have yes. that too in the, yeah when i just moved yes. to well i was gravitating in the beginning towards those just because of that connection to my home right and and the familiarity in the food and the language and the cultural traditions holidays as well yeah, so that's that's a good point. Well, thank you for sharing that. Build your business from the ground up. Could you share one of the biggest lessons uh, for you while building that business? Yes, one of the biggest obstacles was that I had no credit history. And you don't build a farm just by paying cash. You have to have credit and a mortgage. But being a new immigrant uh, meant I had zero credit history. Of course. Yeah. And the way I was raised was that you don't borrow money, you save money ahead of time until you pay cash. Meaning once again, you have no credit history. And that is a catch 22. Without a credit history, you don't qualify for credit. That did not end until my then employer went to a uh, an appliance store with me and explained to the owner that, look, Bridget needs to build a credit history she wants to buy a freezer. She has the cash in the bank to pay for it. She needs to buy this freezer in three installments, make it happen. And they did. And little by little, I did build a credit history. Of course, that was before credit cards were common. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, I was one of the very first women in the area to have a credit card in my own name. Oh, wow. At that time, you know, back in the day, Husbands had to co-sign for their wives' applications. Yeah. And if the husband passed away, the credit card went away because the income went away. You know, the only way it would be different is if she had a job in her own name 
with enough income to support a credit card. And that would happen more likely in cities like Chicago or New York, Mm -hmm. much less likely out on the farm, you know, where women worked just as hard, but they didn't draw a paycheck that could be used to make them qualify for a credit card. Some things were unexpected like that. And sometimes helpers had to step in. I wanted to continue building my credit history. So when I bought equipment, I went to the local bank and said, uh, I need to buy this uh, hog building. And it uh, happened to be a, a portable building that somebody was selling. And I told the loan officer I had 50% for down payment and I needed to borrow the other 50%. And he thought that was just the funniest thing he'd ever heard. <laughs> who, who had ever heard of some girl from somewhere else coming here oh, wow. wanting to build a hog farm? How ridiculous was that? It only moved forward after my boss went to the vice president of the bank and said, look, I am part of of this project. I get some of the hogs that she is going to raise. I want her to have that line of credit. I did get the line of credit and I never missed the payment. And, And this is how you build your credibility one step at a time. Wow, what a story. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I... I came here in the beginning of 2000 in, in this country, and I only realized it recently, actually, I read somewhere, I didn't even know that part of the story where women were not able to get the credit cards. And of course, when I was growing up, we didn't have credit cards either. Like, I didn't I didn't know what the credit card is. But you sharing that, um, yeah, it's fascinating. I'm so glad we've, <laughs> we, we now not there where we were even though we still have a lot of things for women to you know achieve and bring up we're still not fully there but thank you for being one of the first women (laughs) you know this way whether it's building your own farm uh, from the ground up and really overcoming all these challenges that came up and and you just figured it out and yeah uh, beautiful beautiful story thank you for sharing that it's just fascinating to me because it's you know it's part of the history and it's just so interesting how it used to be so I want to talk about your book I want to come back to your book Um, I love the name the name of the book is half pigs will travel I cannot wait to read this book. I know it's in the works um, and definitely when it's out, we will uh, post the links to the book so that our uh, listeners could get a copy. But please share with us, how did the the name come up? It came out when I started selling breeding stock and because it was a health certified herd, I wanted to limit the number of human visitors as much as possible because they all brought bugs with them. What what we went through with COVID, you know, limiting exposure to outside people that are not in our bubble. Yeah. That was a that was a, a concept of uh, high health animal herds for as long as I can remember. So if somebody bought animals, I set up a delivery time and I delivered them. So I I was on the road a lot with a uh, full size pickup truck, pulling a livestock trailer going into five states and uh, delivering uh, my pigs. Of course, that was before cell phones. I did have a radio in there. Uh, It was before audiobooks and CDs. But uh, going down the road, pulling my trailer and listening to public radio, when nobody could call me, nobody could bother me, it was almost like a working vacation. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the animals that stayed on the farm had to be fed before and after. So before I left and after I got home. So those were very, very long days. But it was a lot of fun, too. So how do you schedule back then? So there are no phones, no cell phones? You schedule over the mail or the delivery? Uh, well, regular landline phones we had. Regular landlines, right. But, okay. 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 But it was it was before internet. Yes. And uh, so it was all by telephone and I would put ads into reg- regular newspapers or uh, farm papers uh, with pictures and little uh, classified <laughs> ads. Yeah. But a lot of it was word of mouth. You know, I made sure that if people trusted me enough to pick out animals for them and, and deliver them, that they would only get the best. I, I never once sold them something that shouldn't be sold. I wanted to make sure those animals had good homes. 
and I also wanted to have satisfied customers. What an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a story behind the name. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And please share with our listeners how they can find you. I know we don't have the the book out yet, but if you wanted to share your website, how uh, our listeners can connect with you. The website is BridgetFranzen.com. Mm -hmm. Be mindful of the spelling. It's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E, -T -T F as in Frank, R-A-N-Z-E-N.com. And there is also, among other things, there is a uh, sample chapter that, that you can uh, read. And we will post a link to the website. How exciting the book is. And congratulations <laughs> on the book. Thank um, you. I cannot wait to read it. This is a Empowered Global Women podcast. You know, I interview women from all over the world. And this is a question I usually like to ask is, what does it mean for you to be a woman of the world. And as you know, we also have a network um, of uh, women from different countries, immigrant women, uh, multinational women. Um, it's called Women of the World Network. Um, and so that's kind of, um, that's where we have our podcast as well. But what does it mean for you to be a woman of the world? It, it was the biggest adventure I could find at the time, coming here and, and then staying here. I never expected to stay. I, thought it would look good on my resume, uh, having you know, moved overseas or traveled overseas and spent some time out of the country. But then I made friends and, and grew roots and never left. But it gives me a whole different perspective of what it's like in different parts of the world. And uh, it makes me appreciate what I have here. I have nothing against the country that I came from. I still go and visit. Uh, I still have family there and I prefer living here and uh, I never regretted the decision. So I expect I will, I will just stay. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the, the wider worldview and, and putting things in perspective and especially now with, with the political upheaval and the divisions, knowing what happened in, in Germany's history, it's, I, I cannot say it's a comfortable spot where I find myself, but, uh, the perspective is certainly helpful. I like to ask that question because it, it's interesting to hear um, different experiences, you know, when we all kind of come to this one culture. And I and, and I also love this country. It gave me so much. Um, I also go back to my country. But yeah, it's um, it's a beautiful experience. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your adventures with us. Mm -hmm. And though briefly, I know you're going to be sharing them more in depth in your book. Um, and so I'm going to finish our conversation with rapid fire questions today. Uh, there are only five of them. So my first question is, um, what is your favorite book name? I have two. Early on, I greatly enjoyed Land of the Burned Thigh, uh, written by Eudora Cole. Uh, it describes the incredible life of a young woman from St. Louis who moved to the pioneer country of South Dakota in the early 1900s to prove up a claim and homestead uh, near the uh, Noah Brule Reservation, starting out in a sod house, you know, when she was a city girl and bringing everything with her that she needed only to find out she had forgotten the matches. Incredible hardship, the incredible isolation. It was a, a compelling compelling story. It's a book that was written more recently. The title is uh, The Woman They Could Not Silence, where a, a woman uh, was put into an insane asylum by her husband because he was tired of her. And again, incredible hardship, incredible obstacles to overcome. And it's a really humbling experience to read the book. A fascinating read. Uh, the author of that one is Kate Moore. Awesome. So my next question is beach or mountains? Some of each. Yeah. Um, I, I like beach, but I, I like mountains too. So I, I want variety. Yeah. Favorite international destination to visit? Greece. Just traveled there for the first time in 2023 mm -hmm. and uh, loved every minute of it. But so much history and, and friendly people. And, and uh, I went in December. Mm -hmm. uh, so the climate was, was great. It was just warm enough. And uh, I'm ready to go back. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Greece is definitely on my list. Okay, summer or winter? Summer, probably. Okay, my final question is, 
things that you have discovered about yourself recently? I discovered that writing a book is a lot of fun and it's a lot more work than I ever thought it would be. I thought I would write the manuscript and then I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, that, that was a year ago. I'm still not done. But it's, it's very interesting. And again, I found helpers. Yes. And uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey and I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of it. Oh, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for playing. Thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast and for this conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you much. Bye-bye. <laughs>